Section 1 You will hear a woman, who has just moved into the area, talking to a neighbour about problems she is having in her house. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 2. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 2. Oh, hi Ruth. How are you? I'm sorry to bother you, Alistair, but I've been having some problems. Oh, come on in. What's happened? Basically, I had a leak from one of the pipes in the bathroom, and water started coming through downstairs, and the kitchen ceiling's badly stained. Uh, I've got the leak fixed temporarily, but I wasn't happy with the plumber, and I wanted to ask your advice. Of course. Well, the first thing I'd say is make sure you choose a local company. That way, if things go wrong, you're close by and it just makes things easier. Let me write this down. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. The plumber who fixed things yesterday was from quite far away, but I chose him because his advert said he did emergency repairs. Well, fair enough. You needed something in a hurry. But another piece of advice I'd give is try to avoid calling anybody on weekends. That'll really bump up the prices. Leave it till Monday if you can. Well, yes, I think I can do that, because the temporary fix should hold... And obviously I'll need the ceiling plastered and eventually redecorated. Yes, yeah, sure. So who would you recommend? Is there a directory? Well, there's quite a good website covering this sort of work. It's www.plasteco.com. Is that with a K? A C. P-L-A-S-D-E-C-O dot com. Got it. Well, I'll try and have a look at that. Yes, it gives price and quality comparisons. Oh, that'll be useful. But I find personal recommendations really helpful as well. You know, you can find out whether you can rely on the company. Well, I know a couple of reasonable plumbers and also some plasterers. Great. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 3 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 3 to 10. There's a company called Peaks Plumbing. Now they're a father and son team. They're really friendly and they tell you information you need in a clear way, you know, so they really understand what the problem is. Right, well, that's good to know. Are they reliable? Well, that's a downside. Every single time I've used them, they arrive late. And friends have said the same thing. But is the work good quality? Absolutely. Another one is John Damerel Plumbing Services. He's very good. How do you spell the surname? D-A-M-E-R-O-L. Right, got that. And does he do high-quality work? Well, it's fine, you know, but I wouldn't say that was his main point. Uh, basically, he comes out cheaper, you know, than other people. I sense there's a but. Is he unreliable? Oh, he comes when he says he's coming, but he's not very courteous, and he has the tendency to be messy. You know, so you have quite a bit of clearing up to do. Hmm, OK. So it's up to you. They're both good workers, and they won't cheat you. Right. And you said you knew some plasterers? Yes. A company called Simonson Plasterers did our living room last year. We chose them because we wanted some fancy work on the ceiling, around the lights. 
So they can do a variety of designs. You've got it. But it comes at a premium because they are more expensive, you know. Than the others. Yes. Or you could go for a one-man firm called HL Plastering. Harry Lester. He's fine, very reliable, if all you want is a simple job. Do either of them do painting for you if you want? After the plastering's dried out, of course. That's what I was going to say. But I should explain that Harry's quite old now, and so he avoids doing jobs which involve tall ladders, you know. But my kitchen isn't too bad for that. I'd have to ask him if he's prepared to do it. Yeah, sure. So I'll start by looking at the website. All those companies are on there, with their phone numbers, etc. Thanks ever so much. You were such a... That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear a speech to a group of volunteers preparing for a town's anniversary celebrations. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. And now for the preparation plans for the town's 250th anniversary celebrations. We are going to follow the same system we had last year, but with a few changes to increase the party spirit. First of all, this time we are going to make the concert on the beach open to everyone without charge. This is because we have been given money by the council for the celebration and also because last year we had so many problems with keeping people out who had not paid. And on top of this, people will not have to pay for refreshments either as these are being donated. Right now, hmm, we are going to divide into four teams. The first one, the beach team, will be responsible for cleaning up the beach on the Saturday morning, picking up litter, bottles, plastic bags, wood and anything else that's lying around. Everyone is meeting at the beach shop at 8am. It's an early start, but we want to give everywhere a good thorough clean. We have had permission from the council to close the beach to get it ready for the anniversary celebration on Sunday. The second team will be responsible for setting out seating in the square for the speeches and prize giving. Again, an early start is preferable, but the vans with the seats can't be there until 9am, so shall we say that everyone should meet at the village hall at 9.30? Starting then will allow extra time if the vans are late. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, the third team will be the judges. 
for each of the various competitions, we will have three judges. On the whole, they will have had experience of judging before. There will be a boat race, a swimming competition, and the best fancy dress. A cash prize will be given to the winner in each category, and for the two runners-up, there will be book tokens. There is a sponsored mini-marathon, and by the deadline, lunchtime today, we had 263 applicants, with ages ranging from 15 to 60. That's 80 more than last year. Each entrant has paid a £20 registration fee to enter, and all the profits will go to the local children's hospital to help fund much-needed specialist apparatus. The fourth team consists of the wardens for the day itself. We are expecting at least 10,000 people, if last year is anything to go by. The fields near the entrance to the beach can be used as car parks, and we need wardens to help make sure the actual parking is more organised than last year, which was a mess. We also need someone to be in charge of the first aid, which will be at the entrance to the beach. Finally, we need some volunteers for the clean-up. Last year we didn't do this very well, and so the council has agreed to provide large bags to collect all the recyclable material, like glass and plastic, etc. But we have to deal with the rest, like leftover food, ourselves. We don't want to leave piles of rotten food around or dangerous bottles. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a business study student called Sam talking to his tutor about an IT project he is going to do for a local company called Turner's. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 26. Hello, Sam. Come in and sit down. Thanks. You're here to discuss your company-based IT project, aren't you? Yes. I've been to see the manager and he's given me a lot of ideas about projects that the company would find useful. But I wanted to ask your opinion about them before I choose one. Yes, that's fine. Now, this company's called Turner's, isn't it? That's right. It's a small engineering company. They make machine components for trade use. They're well established. They started in 1976, but they're a bit old fashioned. OK. And what kind of projects did Turner's suggest you could do for the company? Well, they want some improvements made to their customer database. Uh, the one that they've got at the moment isn't very useful in some ways. I had a quick look at it. Uh, mm. That would be a very straightforward project, and it'd be simple enough to evaluate, but I don't think you'd get enough out of a project like that. You wouldn't learn anything new. Well, another project they suggested is to do with their online sales catalogue. At the moment, customers can look at their products, but they can't actually order them online, which m must affect their competitiveness. 
But I said I thought it would take too long. It's quite a big task. You're right. It's too much for the time you've got. It's a pity, though. Then they want some help with their payroll system. At the moment, the way they calculate pay involves a lot of manual accounting. I suggested they could have a system where employees register electronically when they arrive and leave work, so the hours they do could be transferred automatically. Hmm. I think you'd get a lot out of a project like that. It would extend your skills, but it wouldn't be too much to take on. A student did something similar a couple of years ago. But this is slightly different.、Hmm. Well, then they need help with their stock inventory. They do everything manually. Really? <laughs> yes, and it takes so much time. Ugh! It's probably very inaccurate too. An electronic inventory would probably be the biggest single benefit for the company. I'm surprised they haven't had it done before. I know. Then they wanted to improve their internal security. The manager had visited other companies where the staff use、uh, swipe cards to access various areas of the building.、It、sounded useful, but the trouble is, I'm not really sure how to do it. Well, I think you're right in that assessment. At the moment, it's probably a bit beyond your level of knowledge. Is that all? Just one more customer service. They want to be able to collect feedback from their customers in a more systematic way. At the moment, it's a bit of a mess, and they probably lose business as a result. Would that involve you going to see customers at their own premises? Because in that case, you might have to do a fair amount of travelling, and that would incur expenses that haven't been agreed with these companies. I never thought of that. Well, it might not be a problem, but it's something that needs clarifying. Well, I hope that's been helpful in narrowing down the options. Yes, it has. Thanks. I'll be able to make a decision now. But while I'm here, can I talk to you about coursework? Sure. Now you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen, and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. I'm not very happy about the way our group assignment is working. There are some problems. No,、oh、dear, are people just not getting on with each other? That's the worst thing. Actually, we're all friends. It's not that. But when we're having a discussion about the assignment, one or two people end up doing all the talking, and the rest don't say anything. It's A bit frustrating because we need plenty of debate. Well, that's a common observation. You're studying in a group with people from all over the world, and you all have your own ways of participating. In some places, students are more used to listening than talking, and vice versa.、Mm, I suppose you're right. I'll try to remember that. Does everyone pull their weight as far as sharing the workload is concerned? I'd say they do. Yes, and. Our group elected、uh, a leader. She's very good at making sure no one's overloaded. But personally, I feel that there are just too many of us in the group. Whenever we try to arrange a meeting, there's always at least one person who can't make it. It's not anyone's fault. It's just that we've all got slightly different timetables. Well, I'm glad you've talked to me about it. Feedback is always useful. Is there anything else you're concerned about?、Uh, there are a couple of problems with. Lecturers that all the students are talking about.、Hmm. Last semester we had negative feedback about the way lectures were organized. There were several occasions when the wrong room had been booked or the same room had been booked twice. That sort of thing. Is that still a problem? That hasn't happened at all, as far as I know. Oh, good. It's sorted out then. But I don't know the reason. But. Some of the staff often turn up late, so we miss ten or fifteen minutes of our lecture time. It might be because they've been copying handouts for students. I think there's a queue for the machine sometimes. Well, I'll look into that. Thank you for telling me. Anything else? <laughs> the other thing is that it can be very difficult to get to see a lecturer individually. They're all very supportive and friendly when you do manage to find them, but often they're not in their office. Even at times when they're meant to be available for consultation. Okay, that's helpful. Now, before you leave,、uh, let... that is the end of section three. 
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a talk on research in the Indian Ocean. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. In this, the first lecture in our series on the changing face of the oceans of the world, we are going to look at the Indian Ocean, into which the Oceanography Department at the Institute here in Australia has been doing pioneering research over the past five years. Let us start with some facts about the Indian Ocean. To give you an idea of the scope and complexity of the enterprise we have undertaken, as you can see from the diagrams here on the screen, showing the relative size of the planet's five oceans, the Indian Ocean comes third after the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, but is larger than the Southern Ocean and the Arctic Ocean. On this slide. You can see that the Indian Ocean is different from the two larger oceans, in that it is landlocked to the north, and does not extend into the cold regions of the North Pole, covering some seventy-three million four hundred and forty thousand square kilometers. The ocean constitutes approximately one seventh of the Earth's surface, and about twenty percent of the world's total ocean area. At the equator. It is around six thousand four hundred kilometers wide, with the average depth being about three thousand four hundred meters, and with the deepest point being the Java Trench at seven thousand four hundred and fifty meters. Flowing into the Indian Ocean, we have some of the world's greatest rivers: the Zambezi here, the Ganges here. The Indus, the Brahmaputra, and the Tigris-Euphrates just here. The two largest islands in the Indian Ocean, Madagascar, here off the coast of Africa, and Sri Lanka, here off the southern tip of India, are structurally parts of the continents of Africa and Asia, while islands like the Seychelles. Are exposed tops of submerged ridges. The Maldives are low coral islands, and Mauritius and Reunion are volcanic cones. The surface waters of the ocean are warm, except where the ocean touches the cold waters to the south. A network of scientists, mainly oceanographers and meteorologists from around the world. Are monitoring changes in the ocean's temperature and acidity, especially where it meets the Southern Ocean, in order to see how global warming is having an effect on the waters there. An assessment is also being carried out on how this is impacting on low-lying habitats and peoples in the more populated coastal regions around the rim of the ocean, in the warmer north. Islands are vulnerable to even the subtlest changes in sea levels and tides, so they are being closely watched. Moreover, a close eye is being kept on wind changes, especially alterations to the monsoon rains, typhoons, cyclones, and any other natural phenomena. In addition to the information sent from the ship. 
that we have stationed off Antarctica, in the south of the Indian Ocean, data are being transmitted round the clock from buoys anchored at various points around the ocean. Five of these buoys are observing ice packs and icebergs coming into the Indian Ocean from Antarctica. Besides the buoys, data on cloud cover and wind and temperature change are received by satellite. Satellite images are also being used to record the size of the icebergs from the moment they break off from Antarctica. Their course is then mapped as they move out into the Southern Ocean. Here at the Institute, the raw data from the various sources are received and the information is then constantly processed by a bank of computers. Once the data have been collated, the next step in the process is the analysis by experts here and at centres around the world looking for even the slightest shift in patterns of temperature, wind and sea levels. In the light of the fact that this is a global enterprise, the Institute is staffed 24 hours a day with researchers working in shifts and we are in constant contact with centres all around the world. In total, 900 experts from around the globe are involved in the programme. The work at the Institute is now into the fifth year of a 10-year data collection, which began in 2003. The analysis of the five years to 2008 will be published early in 2009. However, changes in patterns are already being noticed since the data have been gathered. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.